good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be here this morning uh, to speak at the IBEC conference, which is becoming a landmark event, as Paul mentioned in his opening comments in the, in the business calendar here in Ireland. I must admit, however, to feeling a bit challenged uh, in speaking to the topic of the importance of the transatlantic relationship between Europe and the United States, um, and particularly such a long and complex uh, relationship, which has been such a significant factor in underpinning uh, the freedoms uh, and the prosperity levels that we all enjoy here in Europe today. Also uh, somewhat uh, challenged um, in doing it all in 20 minutes with Olivia breathing down my neck over here. And I suspect Danny McCoy and IBEC had Bill Clinton in mind for this slot uh, when they put it into the agenda, but despite Danny's powers of persuasion, he had to settle for myself. So over the next um, 15 minutes or so, I'd just like to share some perspectives um, on both the political and the economic underpinnings of the transatlantic relationship. And to start uh, with the political relationship. Um, here in Europe, we still tend to take the closeness of the political relationship between the US and the EU and the natural support of the US for Europe as a given. Uh, a long-standing arrangement, uh, which despite differences from time to time, will endure well into the future. However, it's worth looking back and seeing how that relationship has evolved over the last 100 years and just seeing what some of the lessons might be about how that will go forward as a political relationship into the future. And if we go back uh, to the early 1900s, Europe obviously received immense support from the US during the First World War. But I think what many people tend to forget is that the US only entered the war in April 1917, which was about three years after it started and about a year and a half before it finished. And after the First World War, the US, to an extent, turned its back on Europe. Uh, President Woodrow Wilson um, was unable to get the support of the US Congress for the Treaty of Versailles, which established the League of Nations. And as a result, the US was not a member of that League of Nations, limiting its influence. And then faced with its own difficulties during the Depression, the US largely stood aside as Europe again slipped back towards war. However, with Britain and France on the ropes, the US again rode to the rescue. Um, and, but once again, in the aftermath of the Second World War, the immediate U.S. impulse was to once again step away and retreat back across the Atlantic. And that was the case until the growing threat uh, posed by the Soviet Union forced a rethink and a recalculation of the necessity for ongoing strong political ties between Europe and the U.S. as a bulwark uh, for the threat to the East. And those concerns led in 1949 to the formation of NATO. And during the Cold War, the grand anti-communist alliance, if you like, between Europe and the US, it overwhelmed the, nat the, nat the national regional concerns in both territories. There were some differences, but the Cold War essentially required the powers on both sides of the Atlantic to work closely together uh, to preserve and strengthen cohesion and to preserve the unity of what was known back then as the West. And at that time, you know, few people in Europe really doubted the necessity uh, to maintain good military capacity uh, to deter the Soviet Union. However, with the fall of the Berlin Wall in uh, November 1989 and with the disintegration of the Soviet Union that followed, the Cold War ended. And the focus here in Europe switched away from a united West and we began to create, to focus more of our attention on a united Europe. And the need for Europe and the US uh, to act in common on defence issues largely disappeared when the Soviet threat disappeared and European defence spending began to be curtailed significantly um, as we focused on other aspects of development in Europe, reducing military capacity here uh, in Europe and uh, reducing capacity to act outside the local sphere of influence. At the same time, the US reverted very much to its national interests, paying less deference uh, to the opinions of the Allies here in Europe, and I suppose that was something that gained more momentum in the aftermath of 9-11. And now we have a situation where the US, which is tired of its commitments in Iraq and in Afghanistan, and of the debt and the deficits that have piled up as a result, is beginning to retrench back. And we've seen that in the US response to the activities in Libya and in Syria. And I think in the future we're going to find that the US is going to be much more sparing uh, in deploying any of its military capacity in the European sphere of influence, as it, in the words of the US administration, it pivots back uh, towards um, the Pacific. And the current prevailing political view in the US is that European countries you know, are opting out of any serious commitment uh, to their own or collective security and that 
I think is a view that's supported by the fact that if you look at NATO and its budget, 75% of the budget is being carried by the United States. And the US feeling on the political front is that you know, they're being really left increasingly with the ultimate responsibility for Europe's security. And we probably expect that would be the case as well. But the military and the political relationship has changed. Um, it's been diminished to an extent over the past two decades with the threat removed from the East. And as a result of that, I think the importance of the economic, the investment, and the trade linkages between Europe and the United States looms ever larger as a means of ensuring that there's a continuing commun communality of interests between Europe and the US. And this is particularly the case, I think, in the face of the growing economic power that we're seeing in other parts of the world. So to move to the, the economic link linkages, um, they run very deep. Um, and the connections represent the largest integrated uh, economic relationship on the planet. If you look at the trade side, uh, the, UX, the EU exports about 360 billion each year to the United States. And that's a similar level of exports that Europe sends to China, India, and Russia combined. So it's a very, very important um, trading partner, obviously, for the EU. The 360 billion dwarfs the roughly 270 billion of exports that the US sends to Europe. Europe accounts for a fifth of uh, US exports, whereas the US accounts for about 16 or 17 percent of e EU exports. On the services front, however, the regions are very intertwined. Um, and Leif referred to, to services a moment ago. The area of telecoms, financial services, advertising, insurance, computer services. And as we know, a healthy services sector is not the be-all be all and end-all, but it is critical to the health of an economy. And it's very critical to the health of both economies in Europe and in the US. And while the US has a merchandise trade deficit of about 90 billion, as I mentioned a moment ago, on the services side, it enjoys a surplus of about 40 billion uh, with the EU. And the fact that the EU and the US are two of the leading services providers worldwide is due in good part uh, to the fact that their, the services have been promoted by mutual investment flows from the U Europe into the US, from the US into Europe. And in fact, it's the foreign investment level that binds Europe and the US uh, so closely together, far more than trade does. And whereas the European and US commercial ties with economies in the East and in the developing world are driven very largely by trade, the commercial ties between Europe and the US are very much founded by foreign direct investment. And that's a very important distinction because trade is a relatively shallow form of integration and generally associated with the early stages of bilateral commerce. Whereas in contrast, a relationship which is built on foreign investment is one where both parties are embedded in each other's economies. And these relationships create more jobs, they produce more wealth, and they produce more, more income than relationships which are based purely on trade. So foreign direct investment is the real backbone of the transatlantic economy. The EU and the US are each other's primary source and primary destination of foreign direct investment. At the end of 2010, um, foreign direct investment by corporate America into Europe totaled about $2.2 trillion, and that was roughly 60% of US foreign direct investment worldwide. European FDI into the US in turn amounted to about 1.7 trillion, about 70% of Europe's FDI worldwide. US firms employ directly 4.2 million or so workers in the EU, while European companies in turn employ about 3.5 million workers directly in, in the US. And Europe accounts for about 50% of the sales outside America of US corporates. And that's double the level of the sales those same companies generate in Asia Pacific. So no other region in the world is as important to the success of US multinationals as Europe is. And looking at the domestic situation here in Ireland, I mean, we think we are very fortunate that our policymakers back in the 1970s had the foresight to recognize the importance of foreign direct investment and particularly the importance of US FDI and to create an attractive environment for that investment. And it is essential that we maintain that attractive environment if the economy is to recover here. US FDI in Ireland is getting on for about $200 billion and that's about 4.5% 
of total US worldwide foreign direct investment. And that's an extraordinary achievement uh, for a small company, a small country. Uh, US companies uh, currently employ about 115,000 workers here in Ireland, very high added value jobs as well, so very important here. But perhaps just as remarkable is the fact that Irish FDI into the US totals about $25 billion. And the same businesses, the Irish businesses in, in America, employ about 100, 120,000 US workers. Uh, the group that I lead, CRH, is responsible for about a third of that employment and for about a third also of that particular investment. So as you can see, you know, the economic linkages between the US and Europe are very strong, as indeed are the economic linkages between the US and Ireland. In both uh, Europe and the US in recent years, the focus really has been very much to the East and to the opportunities presented by the rapid growth in the Asian economies. And all of you here, I'm sure, have been wondering, how do we get advantage? How do we take advantage of that? What's the opportunity? And of course, that's all due to the fact that it's projected that by 2030, uh, Chinese GDP on its own uh, will equal that of the EU and will also be broadly equal to that of the US. And that obviously presents amazing opportunities. But I think the focus on Asia often leads us to overlook um, the importance of the transatlantic relationship. And I think what's mainly overlooked in this is GDP per capita. The Carnegie Foundation has done some projections. And again, these projections say that sometime before 2030, China will outrank the US in terms of GDP. But they also look at the GDP per capita. And by 2030, their current estimates are that GDP per capita in the US will be $60,000. Their projection is that GDP per capita in Europe will be about forty dollars to $45,000. GDP per capita in China, even with rapid growth, will be about $15,000. So the continuing similarities between the two transatlantic economic blocks in terms of wealth levels and the resultant demand for similar goods and services and the economies of scale involved in that should not be underestimated. Together, the EU and the US offer a market uh, which represents about 40% of global GDP currently. It's a market of 800 million consumers with significant spending power and pretty similar tastes in many respects and pretty similar ambitions. And I think that's why the announcement some weeks back uh, that the EU and the US are to begin formal talks on a free trade agreement is very important development. It provides an opportunity to build further on the very strong links that already exist uh, between the EU and the US. It's a very ambitious project. It focuses on improving market access harmonizing regulatory issues in pharmacy, healthcare, chemical, and other segments. We've seen how difficult it has been harmonizing uh, regulatory issues in areas um, as straightforward, or some people might argue with that, as accounting issues. Um, and it also prevents challenges in um, relating and harmonizing issues relating to intellectual property, which is obviously a vital area, particularly given some of the practices in some of the eastern regions, and also harmonizing on competition issues and sustainability. So it's a very big project, and it's to be hoped that those talks will progress more speedily than some of the world trade talks that we've seen over the past decades. Because really, as we all know here and has been recognized with some of the earlier contributions, both Europe and the US were sorely in need of a boost to economic growth that such an agreement could deliver on both sides of the Atlantic. So to wrap up, um, I think on the political side, you know, Europe's evolution uh, to its present political state occurred to a large extent under the mantle of the US security guarantee, and it couldn't really have happened without that. I mean, it's been commented that the two decisions that have made the new Europe possible, the first was the decision by the US to stay in Europe after the Second World War, and the second was France and Germany's commitment to economic integration, which was reflected in the European Coal and Steel Community Agreement of 1951. But times have moved on. Uh, the US is currently seeing its strategic interests as driven to a greater extent by developments in other parts of the globe than Europe. And Europe's capacity uh, to support the US in its strategic interests are hampered by the struggle to preserve the euro, to reignite growth, in the Eurozone economy, and also by European decision-making uh, process and by Europe's inability to project power much beyond its own uh, boundaries. So if the common uh, strategic interests between Europe and the US 
uh, which sustain the transatlantic relationship for much of the 20th century are weakening. Uh, we in, need, in Europe need to work uh, to reinforce and strengthen the economic ties. And that is why increasing transatlantic investment and trade is vital for the future of the relationship. I think everybody recognizes that the rising powers are resetting the global economy. But a different global economy is not necessarily a worse one for the EU or for Europe. And that's provided both regions work individually and together to address the issues of competitiveness and productivity, uh, to work together to leverage uh, mutual growth opportunities, to incentivize innovation, improve educational standards, and to tackle the twin challenges of deficits and debt. So thank you for your attention. And uh, I hope, Olivia, I'm within the allowed time frame. You're admirable. <laughs> Thank you. Admirable. Thank you. Admirable. <laughs> Thank you, Miles.